1981, millionaire Eugene Lang, you see a picture of him up on the screen, was asked to speak to a class of sixth graders from East Harlem, New York. What could he say to this group of students? This was his alma mater uh, decades and decades ago. What could he say to this group of students whom most of them would probably even drop out before they got to graduation from high school? And in fact, just before Lang went out to speak to the class, uh, the principal of the school told Eugene Lang that 75% of the class would not finish high school, these sixth graders. 75% would not finish high school. So scrapping his notes, uh, Eugene Lang decided to speak from his heart. And among other things, he said to those students, stay in school and I will help pay the college tuition of every one of you. That was a turning point. For the first time in their lives, these students had hope. One of the students said, I finally had something to look forward to, something waiting for me. It was a golden feeling. The graduation rate of that school averaged about 25% of the class. This particular class that Lang made this promise to 90% of the class graduated from high school. 90%, not 25%. People without hope are a people without a future. People without hope are a people without a future. A study conducted by researchers at the University of Minnesota found that 15% of American teenagers um, felt highly likely that they would not live to see their 35th birthday. 15% of American teenagers felt that. And those were the teenagers, those teenagers with this pessimistic outlook that were much more likely to engage in reckless behavior because they didn't have a future. People without a hope are people without a future. And people without a future don't live very, very well in the present either. When people have no hope for their future, they not only give up on their tomorrows, but they also give up on their todays. But when hope is restored, life is restored. In fact, history proves over and over that people are able to endure great trials in the present if they have a bright future to look forward to. And we could give example after example, but since it's our 140th birthday, we can just look at our forefathers and foremothers who came from Sweden over here. They suffered great trials and hardships and went without with deprivation, but they did so because of their hope in the future. If you look at the hymns of those old Swedish settlers, they were all about heaven. They preached and talked about heaven. They had hope in the future, and so they were able to endure difficult present circumstances. And so the title of the sermon is this, The Secret of, of Coping. The Secret of Coping is Hoping. That is the message that God is communicating in this text for this morning in, in Romans chapter 8. God is telling us that we can endure the sufferings of this life because of our hope for the next life. We can endure the sufferings that we go through in this life because of our hope in the next life. In this passage, the Apostle Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, asked the question, how do we cope with today's problems, with today's troubles, with our pain and our suffering? And then Paul answers that question by saying we're able to endure suffering as Christians because of our hope in the future glory in Christ Jesus. In these eight verses, the Apostle Paul is juggling three major themes. Three major themes. Actually, he's only juggling three themes. There's no minor themes. There's just three themes here. And they are our suffering, our hope, and our future. Those three things. That's all he talks about throughout these eight verses. Our suffering, our hope, and our future. Um, I've actually created a chart, if you'll look at it on the screen. And you can see on the left-hand side, there's the three topics. And if you read across the screen, you can see where uh, those topics are talked about in the verses. So, for example, in suffering, uh, 
is talked about in verses 17, 18, 20, 22, and 23. And you can see those are the topics, and you see how the topics are mingled together. One verse isn't just about suffering. It might be about suffering and hope and how they're mixed together. But I want you to notice on uh, that chart, not only are, the to are these topics evenly divided, but notice that every time Paul talks about suffering, again, that's verses 17, 18, 20, 22, and 23, in every verse he talks about suffering, he also talks about either hope, our hope, or our future, or both. He never talks about suffering by itself. It's always in connection with our hope and our future. And so, in order for us to understand this passage uh, more clearly, we need to look at each of these three themes a little more closely and what, what the Apostle Paul is saying in this text about our suffering, our hope, and our future. Let's start by looking at what Paul says about our suffering. And I'm going to read those verses across the uh, chart there and listen for the suffering that Paul talks about in these verses. You're also going to hear about hope and future because he mixes them all together, but listen for the suffering here. Paul says, now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will, will be revealed in us. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we, eagerly, as we wait eagerly for our, ad our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. This passage hits us right where we live. Paul couldn't be any more practical than to address suffering in our life, right? Whether it be illness or death or grief or divorce, whether it be disappointment or bankruptcy, we all suffer in this life. We have all suffered in the past. We're all going to suffer in the future, and some of us are suffering right now. As Christians, Scripture is clear that we're not exempt from suffering. And the Apostle Paul does not hide the fact that believers suffer in this life. In verse 17, Paul says that in order to be children of God, in order to be co-heirs with Christ, we must share in Christ's suffering. He says that in verse 17. In verse 18, Paul reaffirms that we will suffer in this life. And in verse 23, Paul says that we as Christians are inwardly groaning as we, as we grieve and suffer in life. Now, in these few verses here, Paul is not giving a comprehensive uh, teaching on suffering. There's a lot of things that Paul is not talking about here when he talks about suffering. For example, he doesn't talk about why we suffer. Um, but what Paul does is he focuses on one thing. Um, he wants us to understand not why we suffer here, but he wants us to understand how to endure when we do suffer, how to cope when we do suffer. And the one point that Paul makes to help us understand that is this. Paul says, for the Christian, suffering is temporary. That's the one thing that Paul says to us, besides the fact that we are all going to suffer, is that suffering is temporary. Paul says this in verse 18. He makes this clear. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. And what God is telling us in this verse, he isn't minimizing the suffering. The suffering is real. The suffering is awful. The suffering that we go through in this life is painful. But what Paul is saying is in comparison to what is lying ahead for us in heaven, the terrible suffering that we're going through right now will seem light and momentary. It will seem light and momentary. Paul is saying if we have to compare this, the pain that we're going through now with the glory that we will have someday, there's no comparison. The glory wins. Glory wins. Paul says in these verses that as Christians we will suffer, and the only specific thing he says 
is that our suffering is temporary, our rewards are eternal. Suffering is temporary, our rewards are eternal. This truth that God wants us to understand um, about suffering being temporary and rewards being eternal is something that God wants to make clear, so he says it over and over and over in the New Testament. Let me share a couple of verses. Um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it's on the screen, verse 17, Paul says this. Now, does this sound familiar? Paul says, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Isn't that exactly what Paul is saying in our passage in Romans 8? When he says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Those are two different ways of saying the same thing. Suffering is temporary. The rewards are eternal. Paul wants us to understand that. God wants us to understand that. God sh shares this again in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, when we are told, And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you. And there it is, the eternal reward and the temporary suffering. Now, I want to say again that as we're going through the suffering in this life, it doesn't seem temporary. It seems like it will be eternal. It seems like it will last forever. But, but we need to have the long-distance perspective what Paul is trying to help us understand here. And so one of the major themes in this passage is suffering. And really the two things that we can draw from this is that Christians will suffer, but that our suffering is temporary. A second major theme in our passage is uh, where Paul talks about our future. Our future. And again, I want to read those verses in this passage that deal with our future. Listen for future and our glory. The glory is part of our future, the glorious future that we have. Uh, listen for them. You'll also hear about suffering and hope. But listen as Paul talks about our future in this passage. He says, now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. That creation itself will be liberated from the bondage to decay and, bonded and, and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. You hear the future in there. As a matter of fact, of the three themes, this is the major theme of the three major themes, is our future. Paul wants us to think about our future, and specifically, Paul wants us to think about our future when Jesus returns and finally and completely conquers and removes the devil, and sin, and death, and disease, because that's also the time that we will be glorified, we will be given new and eternal bodies, and we will live with God forever. And when that day of glory comes, it will not only be for all Christians, but it will be a universal event. And that's what Paul is communicating here in this passage too. Um, not only will the followers of Christ be changed, but but the entire universe will be changed. In Revelation chapter 21, we're told that when that day comes, God's going to not only change believers, but there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Creation itself looks forward to that day when, when humans fell in the garden and we sinned and we were under the curse. Creation also fell under the curse. And Paul is saying here in this passage that creation is longing for that day when the curse will be removed, and there's no more famines or earthquakes or tornadoes or droughts. And so what is this glory that will be revealed that Paul is talking about? What is the future that's so good? What, how is our future so good that, it may, that our present suffering is not worth comparing to? Well, Scripture talks a lot about it. I want to bring out a few points. I'm, I'm going to list them up on the screen. 
if you will look on the screen, you will see this is what we're looking forward to. We're looking forward to new eternal bodies on that day. This is that glorious day when Christ returns. We're going to experience a new heaven and a new earth, one that isn't broken. We're going to be able to rest from our labors. We're going to be rewarded for our service here on this earth that was done in the name of Christ. We're going to be able to enter into our eternal homes and join our eternal family. We're going to experience an absence of suffering, one of the major themes here in this text. The absence of suffering, the absence of sin, the absence of disease, the absence of decay. We will be face to face with Jesus Christ. And we will be experiencing rewarding work. We will, get, we will be given things to do in heaven. Important, valuable things. And these are just some of the things. I encourage you again to go back and read Randy Alcorn's book on heaven. I, somebody was just talking about how they're reading it right now. That will give you a much clearer picture, scriptural picture, of what our glorious day will be like. So one of the themes in this passage is suffering. A second theme in this passage is our glorious future. The third and final theme of this passage is our hope. It's our hope. And again, I want to read those verses that speak to our hope. Listen for the hope in this passage. Paul says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. And we know that the whole of creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we eagerly wait for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes? For what they already have. But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In verse 24, Paul says, For in this hope we were saved. In this hope we were saved. When we put our faith in Jesus and his work on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, we received the hope that we will one day be glorified that we'll be given eternal bodies, that we will live forever with Jesus. And because we have this promise from God, because we have this awesome future, we have a hope that is greater than our present suffering. This hope is greater than our present suffering. And so our hope in this glorious future gives us the strength to endure the trials of today. But not only does this hope give us the uh, the ability to endure the trials of today, but we find that as Christians, we not only endure, but we, we eagerly anticipate. This passage says this hope gives us an eager anticipation. Twice in these few verses, Paul uses that phrase. Because of our glorious future, we not only wait for that day, but we eagerly wait for that day. That phrase, eagerly uh, wait, is used in verse 19. And 23. And that phrase, that eager expectation, that describes a person who's scanning the, the horizon with their, their head leaning forward, where they are, are looking for any glimpse of the glory of Christ to come. This is an eager expectation. We're not just passing time here on earth waiting for Jesus to return. We're eagerly longing for him to show himself. What this what this phrase is communicating is as much as you've longed for anything. Say when you were a child and you were longing for Christmas Day and to see what was under the tree. That eagerness for the Christmas Day, it's greater than that. Or your wedding day or a great vacation or whatever you've eagerly longed for. This eager longing as we wait, this hope that we have is, is a greater eagerness. This, this form of the Greek verb Eager expectation is used seven times in the, in the New Testament, and all seven times it's only used in reference to our waiting for Jesus to return. When the New Testament talks about our waiting for Jesus to return, the New Testament writers talk about it as an eager expectation. We wait for a great and glorious day, as the hymn writer says. So 
Paul is saying some amazing things here in this passage. Our future is so bright that we have a great hope. It's not the normal kind of hope. It's not a human kind of hope that I hope I, I get a raise. This hope comes from God. It's assured. And this hope is so wonderful that we wait for it with eager expectation, with bated breath, on tiptoe. We're waiting for Jesus to come back and give us what we're looking forward to. And that even in the midst of our suffering, we can have an eager expectation. But it gets even better than that. In verse 25, it's not only an eager expectation, but Paul tells us that we're also able to wait patiently. Do you see the end of verse 25? Paul says, but if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. We're already waiting with eager expectation. We're already waiting on tiptoe for this future glory. But Paul says we also do it patiently. And what Paul is communicating there, that patience is communicating an endurance. If we're patient, we're enduring. There's a patient endurance of the suffering that we go through. So the hope that we have is so great, not only does it cause us to eagerly long for it and look for it and hope for it, but it causes us in the midst of our current pain and our current loss and our current suffering to patiently endure. That's how great this hope is. That's how wonderful our future is. So Paul is trying to communicate here. It's an awesome truth. This life is full of troubles and full of trials and full of difficulty. And as I look out into the congregation, I see terrible stories of suffering that you guys are going through. You probably are going through something right now. I'd like you to fill in the blank. Whatever, pick something that you're going through right now. That's a trial. That's a struggle. And apply it here to this passage and to this promise. The suffering is hard. The pain is real. The problem is difficult. But the Apostle Paul is reminding us that when we suffer, we also hope and we wait. We anticipate and we endure. What do we hope for? We're hoping for that great and glorious day when Jesus Christ returns. And so we remember as Christians that the best is yet to come. We don't give up as we experience suffering and pain in this world because we know that the suffering is temporary and the rewards are eternal. You know, even though the, the book of Romans is a very heavy the, uh, book of theology and theological document, the Apostle Paul in this passage wasn't wanting us to come away with theological points. In these verses, in these eight verses, he was wanting us, us to come away with hope with hope in the midst of our suffering, with something to hang on to, an ability to endure. What Paul wanted for us is to have a renewed assurance that God, who began a good work in us, will indeed bring it to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. And so I want to close by going back to that opening illustration of Eugene Lang and that sixth grade class. That class didn't have hope until they were given a future. And then once they had a future, they were able to live well in the present. And that's our story as Christians. We have a great future. Th those students, once they were promised college tuition, that doesn't mean that their homework was magically already done for them. They had to struggle. It didn't mean that their papers were already written for them. They had to work and struggle and sweat through those papers. And they had to earn their high school diploma. But they were able to go through the grind and the struggle and the suffering because of the future that they were looking toward. And, and that describes us. People who have hope for the future live well in the present. And that's who we are as Christians. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the hope that we have because sometimes life is hard and can be overwhelming. But you've reminded us of our future. And that hope gives us the ability to endure now and even longingly look forward 
Give us the grace for this day. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.